right, all right. Assalamu alaikum, shalom, shalom, hotep, Islam, alafia. We are live. We are live with a very special episode. We are live with a very special episode here tonight. Episode number 29. Episode number 29. This is for hip hop right here. This is for hip hop. Last week we did an episode for Islam. This is for hip hop right here. This is for hip hop. So all my hip hoppers, come on in. Come on in. All of my hip hoppers, come on in. Come on in. It's about to get serious. Also, Walaikum salam. Also, man, have your papers and pens ready. Have your papers and pens ready. This is for hip hop right here. I got my brother, Brother Wise. Brother Wise, come on in, brother. Come on in, Brother Wise. Come on in. This is for hip hop right here. All of my hip hoppers, come on in. Let me see if I should wear my hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All my hip hoppers, come on in. I'ma send you a request, I right, come on in. Okay. Oh, it's not letting me, okay. Peace, peace, beloved, peace. Peace. Islam, what's going on, nah, bro? What's going on? How are you? I'm fantastic. Indeed. I'm fantastic. You, you good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, um, I had to rush home because I, I didn't want to reschedule this live again. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we've been playing a lot of phone tag. Right, right, indeed, man. But um, man, thank you for your patience, though. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your yeah, um understanding and and um having you know this live with us. I appreciate that. Oh no problem. I appreciate you. You know, I was I was the reason we was canceling some of the other times. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. You know, good. right, Happy. right. So um, I see now we we finally. Um, can have a sit down. Uh, we finally can, you know, talk about all of the questions and all, all of the social issues um, that have been um, plaguing us, uh, you know, for some time now. So um, I'm gonna go do the intro uh, and then I'm gonna, you know, invite you on in. All right, family. Assalamu alaikum, shalom, shalom, hotel Islam, alafia, peace, peace, happy Monday, happy Monday. Happy Monday and happy Indigenous Day. That's right, happy Indigenous Day. I hope all is well. Um, as I said earlier, we have a very, very special and uh, impactful uh, episode here uh, tonight. Uh, so definitely you want to um, have your pen and papers ready. Um, again, as I said, this is for hip hop. We're gonna be talking on hip hop, the music industry, um, education, books, of course, because this is a books page. Um, and every other thing, um, in, every other thing that has um, caused us to be in a position that we are today as a people. So uh, tonight, uh, I have a very special guest by the name of Wise Intelligent. Um, he is from the group, the historically golden era '90s hip hop group, Paul Rice's Teachers. Uh, Wise Intelligent. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, this is going to be one of our DTR360 Books podcast classic uh, episodes. So, um, without further ado, uh, help me present Wise Intelligent. Thank you, brother. I don't have no applause, so I got to do the hand clap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, welcome, welcome, brother. How you feeling today? I'm great, man. I'm great. Thanks for having me. How, how are you? Man, um, I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. Um, I'm amped up. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm, I'm amped up. Uh, I think you are one of our, well, the first hip-hop artists uh, that we have 
um, on our podcast show. So thank you for being the first. Wow. Wow. Yes, I'm, I'm soldier boy. I'm <laughs> soldier boy. <laughs> the first <laughs> rapper to be in this space. Right, right. Um, and um, uh, hopefully um, the, the next interview, inshallah, we can um, be in a flesh uh, together and have a face-to-face -face, um, interview. But um, let's get started. Uh, so tell us about your upbringing. What was that like growing up in, in Trenton, New Jersey? You know, I, I hate to say it was typical, but it was. You know, it was typical urban youth, urban America, 1970s, early 70s, you know, um, 80s, you know, 90s, you know, uh, single mother. You know, my parents were married, you know, they were married, you know, when I was born, you know, uh, so they they separated when I was about four years old, you know, and um, <clears throat> that was it. And after that, you know, I didn't see my father no more after that, you know. Yeah, I was about three. I was about three or four when they separated. So I didn't see him no more after that. And that and and the family just, you know, that's when that's when shit got real, you know. That's when shit got really real, you know, living in the hood, living from ghetto to ghetto. You know, uh yeah, it was a, that's when the struggle really got real. Uh, you know, that's when this it, it became an acute struggle for for us as youth. That's when we start to realize because before that, you know, we didn't really know what struggle was. We had no idea. Right. You know, but till mom was left holding the bag, you know. Mm. So what was it like growing up without a father? It was you know, it turned into a lot of street time for us, you know. I have, I have a large family. You know, uh, like nine siblings. You wow. know, so uh, we had a lot of street time. You know, a lot of street time and and and, and a lot of peer training. You know, peer to peer training. You know, uh, we were going peer to peer before technology coined the term. Right. <laughs> you know, everything was peer to peer. The information, the uh, the manhood training. You know, uh, which wasn't really manhood training because it was a a, a misinterpretation or uh, a false presentation of what manhood really is and what it's about. So, so yeah, it, it, it compounded the struggle. You know, there's some of the, the misinformation we were getting and giving to each other it compounded the struggle in a lot of ways. But, you know, um, it was tough, you know, not having uh, someone close to you, you know, a father around to represent that polarity of balance, you know, that, that balance in the polarity, you know, so. So we turned to the streets, and, and the streets is pretty much where we learned what we thought it was, what, what it meant to be a man. Mm. And, and, and would you say that the streets pretty much raised you into becoming um, a man, you know, well, obviously the man that uh, you are today, it, uh, whether it be good or bad, it helped to, to raise you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, without question. You know, um, you live and you learn. You live and you learn. I think that's part of heuristics, right? Uh, trial and error. You know, uh, so, yeah, we we bumped our heads a lot. We fell a lot. Got up, got up even more, you know. Mm -hmm. Don't think you're going you're gonna to survive, you know. Got to get up more times than you fall, <laughs> you know, but, yeah. Right. I mean, I mean, uh, even today, we still see – you know, young boys um, growing up without a father. We, we still see, I mean, uh, statistically, um, it's been said that 64% of um, mothers are, are single, are, are headed by black single mothers, African black single mothers. So that's a large percentage of, you know, us growing up still without a father. Um, and, and then some of us who do have fathers in our lives, still they're not in our lives like if, if, if that makes sense right so like i i could talk for me personally um my father was in my life but he wasn't like in my life but he didn't give me any suggestion he didn't he still didn't teach me how to be a man right so at, just like you i had to learn that from the streets um and i had to learn that from other people 
and from other men who were on TV and who were on, um, who, who was in magazines and who was in corporate America once I got to college and so forth. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely a, a struggle and it's unfortunate. Very, very yes, it, absolutely. I mean, this, this is what, what my writings have been built on. You know, it's been built on this reality. You know, uh, in fact, in a, in a song that I did in, uh, I think, 2016 called Stuck. You know, the song's called Stuck, and I, I, I mentioned that. So I look back when that past and type fast. I know tasks, no dads present for none of us adolescent, young black youth who grew to be men, not having a point of reference, you know. And that's that's what the that's what my life has been about documenting that that struggle. You know, uh, you know the, the good thing about you know about uh, all of it is you know when you come to a certain level of knowledge of self and you start to look at the environment in which you're embedded and you start to see the contingencies in the environment and how they are shaping the behavior inside that environment. It it, it gives you a, a greater opportunity or uh, a greater probability of of overcoming it, you know, because now you're not interpreting yourself by the environment. You're not defining yourself by the uh, the dysfunction within the environment. You begin to redefine yourself when you reach a certain level of knowledge of self, you know, when you, when you gain the ability to separate yourself from the environment that you're embedded in. So, so yeah, man. Nobody in my, you know, growing up in the projects, no, none of my friends' fathers was around. I knew all the mothers. I wow. knew we all knew each other's mothers. You know, I don't know none of my my uh, friends' fathers. You know, growing up, and I mean, we we forty and fifty years in, we mm. forty fifty years in, all that time we don't you know, know each other's fathers. Mm. You know, there were literally no no fathers in the projects when we were growing up. Mm. You know, wow. But yes, yes, fathers are definitely important. Um, I'm all for the African um, structure unit. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the um, two unit household, the mother and father. Um, obviously the mothers, they have done it alone, uh, uh, alone um, and they have had some success, but they can even tell you that it's hard and difficult just being one parent. So um, it's much easier and it's much successful when we do it together. Um, so speaking of knowledge of self, right? So what sparked your consciousness and how did you become aware of the world in which we live in today? Uh, nation of gods and earths, you know, 5%, 5%, Please. you know, yes. you know my, 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 my brother, you know, my physical brother, power, he, uh, he had lessons, you know, early. You know, he had lessons early, and uh, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't really gravitate to lessons or from how it was presented. You know, how it presented. I, you know, I wasn't a, I wasn't a, a proponent of how it was being presented to me. You know, because you know, I'm a kid growing up in the hood like the rest of the kids. You know, and I, and I'm like, nah, y'all not gods. You know, so that was my that was my approach at 13 years old. That's how I was looking at it. It was like, nah. I mean, because I I know what y'all do. I know I know what you do. I know how you move. I know how, I know how y'all function out here. You know, so it was hard for me to really, you know, take the take the take the bait hook line and sinker or whatever. You know, I couldn't take the information fully. You know, so because of the messengers. You know, so I was basically blocking out the message based on the messengers. You know, uh, so, that, so that my physical get he got incarcerated. He got incarcerated, but before he got incarcerated, he wrote he wrote the name Wise Intelligent on a piece of, in his notebook and tore it out, and gave it to me. He was like, "That's your name." He said, "That's what I'm calling you from now on." You know, really? I was thirteen. Wow. You know, and, and then he and then he got incarcerated. You know, and he left lessons, left lessons, and he, he the mathematics. You know, spring out student in moment. And so I, you know, I started reading. I started going down the rabbit hole a little bit. You know, one of those, you know, I was one of those people that, you know, if I didn't understand a word, I was going to go to the dictionary, the star, the etymology, 
you know, I was going to go into it even back then. You know, it's just what it was. I didn't like to not know what I was reading or talking about, or understanding certain things. So I wanted to know. I had a, a youthful curiosity around, you know, and a desire for knowledge and information. So I read it. I'm like, okay, it makes sense. You know, it makes sense. You know, um, it, made, it made a lot of sense, you know. So I started going in, going really, really deep into lessons, you know, and uh, I started associating with other 5%, you know, in the community and they were, you know, that I had already known, but but wasn't really hanging out with like that. But, but then, yeah, I, I went a long way down the rabbit hole. <laughs> the rest yeah. is it. But, but yeah, but you know, my, my neighborhood, everybody was 5%. And everybody okay. was 5%. You know, you can, you know, uh, God's Avenue, God's Avenue, which is Pacific Street, you know, in Trenton, New Jersey, you know, Divine Land, which is the projects mm-hmm. we, we came up in and we got, you know, that's where the group launched from and everything. Um, we spent most of our youth time, you know, uh, our, our formative years, you know, was spent in the projects, living in the projects. And, you know, it was Divine Land because everybody was five sinners. I mean, that was the tag on the wall, huge. Wow. You know, graffiti artists tagging the wall, Divine Land, like huge. So, you know, it was hard to really, you know, you had to have been raised, raised in Divine Land to not have lessons and not, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't eat pork around there. You couldn't, you know, couldn't nobody catch you doing certain things, you know, uh, that contradicted the lessons in any kind of way, even if you wasn't a five percent, you know, it was just, it was tough. It was going to be hard on you. <laughs> it was going to be hard on you, but everybody was five percent, you know, everybody was five percent. So, yeah. yeah. That's what's up. So, as you say, you grew up around that environment and um, uh, PC, a brother, so your physical brother who helped um, give you the knowledge, he was your enlightener who helped give you the knowledge, um, knowledge of self. Um, and you did the rest. I mean, the rest was history, right? Um, so I, I want to get into um, the 5% Nation. Um, who, uh, who is the 5%, 5% Nation? And um, why isn't the 5% Nation, I guess, um, publicized on social media as I see some of the other organizations like the Nation of Islam, of course, um, and so many other organizations? I, you know, I can't answer that question for you. I'm, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, the, the 5% Nation of God's Nurse, you know, uh, was founded by, given birth to, by Father Allah, you know, Clarence 13 X Smith, left the Nation of Islam in 1964. You know, and the Father, you know, took the lessons to the youth in the streets. You know, he wanted to reach the kids that were that we're not gonna go, we're not gonna put on a bow tie, not gonna sell bean pies, you know, wasn't gonna be functioning within a structured and uh, heavily disciplined environment. You know, he wanted those kids that was hardest to reach. He wanted to reach those kids that was hardest to reach. Us, <laughs> you know, us, you know, and and um, and the pop sin was giving birth to, you know, and so. Yeah, that's the five percent. Five percent, you know, believe the black man is God, and that's what we teach. You know, don't believe in the teachings of the ten percent. You know, all wise know the true and living God is. That's and that's what's taught. You know, um, so yeah, that's the five percent. In a, in a, that's the uh, the cliff notes. (laughs) (laughs) That's the cliff notes on the five percent. Right, indeed, indeed. Um, so um, you're saying that the black man is God. So break that down for the people who may not know what that what philosophy um, or ideology that comes from. You know, not a philosophy, not an ideology. It's a. It, it, you know, in order for us to really to really have a conversation about about God and who and what God is, we would have to agree on some some tenets around what God is and what belief is, because most people come into conversations with, you know, with their confirmation biases. 
you know, with anchor biases, with, you know, biases that are uh, rooted in a particular belief, you know, based on a particular uh, set of, uh, a, a particular group of information, you know, some information that they have in their head and they rely on that sole information for their definitions of things, you know, so they don't really understand, you know, where you're coming from a lot of times and you don't, you know, so it's hard to have a conversation with people unless you can agree on certain terms. What is the meaning of God to you? Mm-hmm. You know, and then from there we can we can have a conversation. But other than that, sometimes it's a it's a waste of energy to uh, to have a kind of have a kind of conversation with people. What to even debate people around the concepts? You know? Right. Right. All right, cool. Um, so h- how did you get into rapping? I was rapping before I was pops. And I was rapping before I got knowledge of self. I, you know, it was, a, it was urban youth, ghetto youth, man. You know, we was watching graffiti rock. You know, we was watching graffiti rock. We, we were, you know, listening to some of the original mixtapes from back in the day with, you know, when Cool Mo D was spitting and Busy B and, and we were getting one of those tapes that were coming down from New York, you know. Um, so we've always been in the hip hop. And then, of course, Sugar Hill Gang and, you know, Run DMC and, you know, so break dancing. I was also a graffiti artist and I used to tag all the time. I used to I used to bomb walls everywhere, you know. I had the book bag with, with the paint in it, you know, getting up, you know. But, yeah, so I was always in hip-hop. I was always in the hip-hop and rap, you, you know. So Culture and I used to make tapes back when we were, like, 11, 11 years old. We used to make tapes, you know, just rapping into the microphone on the on the box, you know with a cassette to an instrumental, you know? So we, we, we were always in, in the rap space, you know? We always, you know, it was, it was, the, language, it was the language everybody understood. We understood it, you know? We understood when we first heard Sugar Hill Gang, when you hear a Busy B, you know, you can relate. Right. You know, you can relate when you watch Wild Style for the first time, you know, you're like, yo, I can relate to these dudes. I can relate to a Ruby D, a, a, a Kaz. Grandmaster Cats, I can relate, you know, they're speaking my language. So we all gravitated towards hip hop culture, you know, because of that, you know, because of that. Right, right, right. So um, what is hip hop? What is hip hop? And um, do you think hip hop is dead in today's time? No, absolutely not. Hip hop is not dead. Hip hop. Hip hop is not dead. You know, it's, you know the 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 idea that hip hop is dead, you know, is based primarily on a mainstream perception of of the culture. Okay. You know, if you if we're allowing the mainstream mainstream corporations, mainstream media, mainstream record companies to dictate for us what hip hop is or is not, yes, we would say hip hop is dead. But they don't have that power or authority to dictate to us what hip hop is. We are hip hop. Mm. We are hip hop, you know. They can't dictate to us. Hip hop is a cultural resource of ours, so they can't tell us what hip hop is or is not. So just because we don't hear certain ideas being disseminated or propagated through these mainstream platforms, or mainstream media, doesn't mean that they don't exist. You know, there's still con- there's still socio political and conscious hip hop. It's still there. There's still. Uh, there's still sisters spitting and not talking about stripping. You know, there's still brothers spitting and not talking about spinning somebody's block. You know, so it's just that they're not represented in these mainstream platforms that we don't control. We don't control those platforms, you know, and that's why you don't hear these concepts. So what, what we're hearing in mainstream media that gives the, the uh, perception that hip hop may be, might be dead or not uh, socially or socially socially politically uh, as stupid or it's a it's a political is the narrative that they want to push. They want to push this idea that we're apolitical, that we're 
that we're sexually deviant. Right. That we're that we 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 drug dealers and users, killers, we're murderers and gangsters yeah. because that narrative has historically, you know, been used to justify the the oppressive policies that they put in place. You know, so we when you look at it that way, you you start to understand what's happening at mainstream. So we can't let mainstream media, mainstream corporations dictate for us what hip hop is. So hip hop, hip hop is alive and well. Mm. You know, hip hop is, is the people. It's amongst the people. It's always with the people. It's always going to be with the people. You know, hip hop is a cultural resource. It's a cultural resource. You know, that belongs to people of a particular culture and group, and and that's where it stays. That's what it is. So it's always going to be alive. It's just that when we get into this whole mainstream thing. That's when, when things get skewed. Mm. So now, um, speaking of hip hop, um, take us back, right? Um, take us back um, to Poor Righteous Teacher Days, um, which you was a part of. Um, was it hard finding a record deal? One and then two. Um, how did you, you or your um, brothers, come up with the name Poor Righteous Teachers? Uh, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't really that difficult back then. You know, it was easier then than it is now. Okay. You know, people may think that it, it's, it was, it was the reverse. You know, people think, oh, it was easy. No, it was easier then. And the, the reason it was easier then is because hip hop was still in place at the mainstream level. You know, this is where hip hop was still found in the mainstream. And I say that because at that time, DJs had power at the radio stations. The DJs were the ones who were breaking the records. DJs were still bringing crates of records to the radio station right. to play their records. So, the so then that created the opportunity for for artists who were dope to be able to bring their vinyl to the to the to the DJ. I'm gonna give my vinyl directly to the DJ. You know, he's he's from the neighborhood. He's he's playing this party over here. I'm just gonna give him this sheet of vinyl. If he likes it, he's gonna play it. You know, that's when the DJs had the ability to play what they like. That's when hip hop stayed fresh. Because the DJs were playing what was new. Because the DJs, just like how the graffiti artists wanted to be the first to tag on a white train or on a on a clear wall, you know, to put their name up. They wanted to go all city. The DJ wanted to be the first to play the new record. That was the whole thing. I yeah. want to be the first to break this record. You know, this new thing is coming. This guy is new. Nobody ever heard him. He's wrong. I'm going to play him. And they're going to be wondering, yo, who is that? Where he get that record from? You know? But what happened was mainstream mainstream corporations, you know, the media, they set up program directors. They replaced mm -hmm. the DJs with program directors. And, uh, and the program, exactly. So the program directors started, you know, programming, setting up the program and programming people. You know, they were programming the audience, pro you know, with this program. And they played the same 10 records 40 times a day, mm -hmm. you know. And now, you, you you know, the DJ has no power, really. The DJ can't say what he want to play anymore. He can't just play a record anymore. You know, so that's so that made it easier, you know, uh, for for us back then because and you and you and you think about it, you know, we we came out in eighty nine, came out eighty nine, nineteen ninety, first album drop, you know, and at that time there were over two hundred, uh, there were over two hundred media corporations. There were over 200 media corporations in the United States. But in 1996, when the FCC signed the, uh, the Communications Act, the Communications Act of 1996 consolidated all of those 200 uh, companies became five. Wow. You know, because it gave companies the ability to own media in other spaces. So if you were the Washington Post, now you had the ability to own TV, radio, music companies and everything so so they all started to just consolidate into this small little cohort of men enough men to fit in a golf cart now control all the media in the country mm. you know and then you had clear channel buying up all the radio so you had everything consolidating 
So now you had the, the small amount of radio stations with the same program. All of them had the same program. They run the same program. You know, it's like, you know, like in our era, when we were coming up, there was no way you would hear the same record playing in Boise, Idaho, that you would hear playing in Brooklyn. Mm. It just didn't make sense. It didn't make sense because the people on the ground in Boise, Idaho ain't living a life like the people living on the ground in New York City. It just wasn't going to happen. So you wouldn't hear the same hip hop like that. It wasn't going to happen. You know, um, and that's why you could still go places like when we were on tour, we could go, we would go to uh, any city that we would go to, whether it was uh, Dayton, Ohio, you know, Cleveland, Ohio, wherever we were at, they had their little, they had their little hip hop uh, havens, you know what I mean? Their little groups of hip hop, you know, that was bubbling. And, and those artists were the local superstars. They could get, they'd be on the radio. Everybody knew who they were. You know, uh, because they could get played and the, the local DJs could play the music, you know. Uh, but it, that doesn't happen anymore, you know. It doesn't happen anymore, you know. So now, like I said, you have the programs, the program directors. They're not... Just messing they're not, everything up. It's an agenda. They have, you know, it's an agenda, it's agenda driven, you know. So, so, yes, it was definitely easier because we didn't have the consolidation of the of the corporations in the platforms that we have today. So. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, um, because I'm thinking like, damn, we could at least take some of that and make it our own, right? Um, we see gentrification is happening. Um, and I know some of us is doing it, but we need more of us that um, taking part in real estate, buying up these buildings so that these European and white corporations wouldn't buy up all of these buildings and then raise the rent on us, right? But then we complain, like, all oh, these white people is coming into our neighborhoods. What are we going to do? So instead of us coming together in unison, just like what they're doing, right, buying up these buildings, buying up these projects, buying up these houses, and then we can have it for ourselves. Um, but I see Jay-Z... The Nas, you know, uh, Masterpiece, which is uh, your partner. We're going to get into Rap Snacks in a bit. They're, they're, um, they're individualized and, and they're business minded where, you know, they're buying up these streaming apps. They're buying up these um, labels, you know, Rock Nations, you know, pu um, publicists, distribution, right? Media outlets or whatever. Um, why aren't more of artists past and present doing the same? When you say the same, you mean buying corporations? Yeah, acquiring. right, right, right. So that we can have more of hip hop. Yeah, you know, that, that's a good question. You know, it's, it's a great question. It's a question, it's the question that Sway was basically asking Kanye right, in that right, thing. Exactly. Uh, Exactly. I think it's, you know, um, you know, f for a lot of for a lot of individuals, it's scale and sell. You know, it's about scale and sell. It's not really about acquiring something and holding it, and you know, as a cultural resource, you know, to to preserve a cultural resource, it's scale and sell. The aim is to scale the company and sell it. You know for most of the entrepreneurs, you know. Um, so what I think the issue is there's no social theory. There's no social theory around the, the acquisition or the establishing of institutions. You know, we don't understand how institutions work. We don't understand that power is exercised at the institutional level, you know. Um, so we, we end up in this, in this cycle of, get the money, secure the bag, chase the bread, you know, because we don't understand that that money is not power in and of itself. You know, money is only as powerful as its ability to acquire real resources, real life sustaining resources. So at the end of the day, it's about institutional power. So that's going to require social a social theory, you know, and a collective social theory for the most part. You know, it's like, it's like, for example, if you take, uh, you take, uh, 
Robert Woodruff and the Coca-Cola family, for example. You know, they started Coca-Cola. It blew up. And, you know, it became so powerful in the state of Georgia. Coca-Cola now basically owns Georgia. And not and not just be so powerful. And the reason that it's so powerful is because they didn't stop at just, okay, we're going to sell these sodas and then we're going to sell the soda company. It wasn't even, about, it, it even about the soda company for them. It, it turned into institutional control. It turns into, you know, social institutions. How can I set up institutions that sustain life? You know, life-sustaining institutions. So Coca-Cola established everything from the Atlanta airport, right? Atlanta Hartsfield Airport, Coca-Cola. Yeah. They donated the land for the airport and put up the funding for that airport initially. They have uh, Piedmont Park. They, that's Coca-Cola. Okay. The CDC. The CDC itself is a Coca-Cola institution. Coca-Cola, the CDC was started in, on Coca-Cola's plantation in Itchaway, Georgia. Wow. Right? So they were establishing institutions because they understand that power is exercised at the institutional level. Right? So they wasn't just, okay, get the money, get the money, get the money. Because if, if you get the money and then you don't have the institutions, then your money is going to be getting extracted from you at the point of purchase every time because you don't and, control institutions, right? right? And you, have you, no don't power. Have, you don't have any power to, to influence policy, right? right? So by controlling institutions, you do. So the CDC, Emory University and Hospital, which is the, the, the most powerful hospital in the South, you know, it's one of the most powerful, more one of the most prestigious medical uh, schools in the in the country, in the world. You know, that's Coca Cola. You know, so that's just a few things that Coca Cola, the, the Atlanta Art Institute, Coca Cola, Coca Cola is behind all of that, and they sit on the boards of everything. It's like they across all the boards for Georgia Power and a bunch of other uh, institutions in in Georgia. So. That's because understanding that one thing that's very, very important, that power is exercised at the institutional level. Mm. Racism is exercised at the institutional level. That's why racism is a power construct. That's why black people can't be racist, because we don't have the power to block people's lives from being sustained in these institutions because we don't control the institutions. Right. So a black person can't be a racist because we don't have the institutional power to impede groups, right? So power is exercised there. And when you think about what we're dealing with, whether it's gentrification or, or uh, the education, that we, the inadequate education that we're receiving in, in public schools, whatever it is, whatever we're looking at and saying, it's, it's, this is racist you know, the police, uh, terrorism, whatever it is that we're dealing with. All those things that we see in that are racist, you know, they're exercising it at the institutional level. It's affecting us because it's institutionalized, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't. These would be, this is because we have to engage these institutions to sustain our own lives. We have to, we have to yeah. engage the court systems, right? We have to engage the, the medical world. We have to engage, engage the hospitals. We have to engage the schools. We have to engage these things to sustain our own lives. So this is where racism, like take gentrification, for example, all right? It's institutional. So we have black churches in the community. The black church in the United States has collected over $420 billion in the past 30 years in the United States, $420 billion. So the black pastor, he, what, does he, what do you do with the money? He takes the money and he deposits it in banks. He's deposited in Wells Fargo. He's deposited in Bank of America and all of these, these banks. We don't own these banks, but these banks are in our communities, right? So, but the same bank, when you or me go to that bank and we try to get a loan to set up a business in, in the community, we get denied that loan. That, Ten times out of nine, we're getting denied that loan if we live in that community. And that's what the redlining thing is, right? So, so they redline us. They like, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna give you the loans to even buy a home right. or to renovate our homes and keep our homes up to standard and 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 what and, and everything. So, so what happens is, okay, now you're denying us loans to do the things that we need to do to develop our communities and families, but you're denying us the money that that came from us from the churches. That's in the, <laughs> these are the ties that we've been playing. So now we can't get any of this money that the pastors have deposited into these banks. 
So then white people come in to the community and the banks give them the loans. They give them the loans to do what they need to build the businesses, to build the housing and all of those things in our communities with the money that the black banks deposit, that the black churches deposit. So, so it's basically, we, we're like crowdfunding our own genocide in a way, right. you know, I mean, we're, we're crowdfunding our own gentrification in a lot of ways, you know, uh, and, and that's what I mean. So we don't control that institution. We don't control that banking institution. We don't control that housing institution. So right. we end up in this, uh, in this dynamic, you know, so that's, that's one of my pet peeves with a lot of, with a lot of the entertainers, a lot of the artists, you know, um, they want to be respected for being these for being entrepreneurs and and getting money. You know, it's like that's fine, that's great. Yeah, you you came from nothing, you came from the mud, you you got it out the mud, as they say. You know, but then they they feel like they're underappreciated. You know, and they want to be recognized amongst these uh, their their Caucasian entrepreneur oh, yeah. entrepreneurial yeah. idols, right? So they want to be, you know. But my thing is always. You know, you want to be recognized like that. You have to do something that sustains somebody's life other than your own. You have to do something. You have to attach yourself to something that's greater than yourself. You know, and that's where life-sustaining institutions come in. And the control of institutions come in. The development and establishment of those institutions come in where, you know, you can exercise that kind of power. And you'll get that kind of recognition for 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 what, you, what you're doing, you know, other than that. Other than that, you you know you just you just a narcissist. Just talking, yeah, you you just talking. And so, man, th that was a great build. That was a great build, right? And so, yes, I a thousand percent agree, right? Institutions is the foundation to power, um, as you just explained with Coca Cola, as you just explained with the hospital in the South. So. And also, you just explained that it's a social construct. It's a social theory that most of us do not agree to. And so this is why we are, it, it's like a vicious cycle, as you just said. We are literally funding our own oppression. We are literally funding our own oppression. And then look up and say, you know, like, why we are not progressing? Why are, are we not moving onward and upwards towards total freedom? right, towards total freedom, because in my opinion, we are still slaves mentally. We are still slaves politically, right? Granted, we are still voting for Democrat over 50 years now, knowing damn well it's not gonna do anything for us, but because a European white guy is a Democrat, we will vote for him or we will vote for her. Uh, so that's insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and expecting a different result. Um, so we know these things, but yet we still do it. Uh, but to your point, we need a social construct. Uh, we need a think tank. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Claude Anderson in Powernomics, which is a great book, he laid out the plan that we should do, that we should implement. That's the next thing. A lot of us, uh, a, a lot of us like to say that knowledge is power, but I disagree because applied knowledge is true power. You can't read all these books and not apply it, then what Then what Ooh. good is it to just read it? We can't read your book, Three-Fifths of a Dumbed Down Rapper, and just think that's it. No, we need to apply the knowledge. Each one, reach one. Keep teaching, keep reaching, so that we can get the word out. Um, and I think that's how you build that social theory and, and that social construct. And for us to um, get on um, a like-minded, um, construct in, in, in a, in, in a like-minded um, group of thinking um, because, man, mm -hmm. I'm just like, damn, like, what is, what, what is it going to take for us to come together and just like you said, for us to build our institutions? And I get the point where you said that we need to, you know, grow in scale, but these European um, organizations and institutions, they're not, um, you know, selling out their um, merger acquisitions and what as, as a matter of fact they merging and they're coming together as opposed to selling it to um black black businesses right so we always you know find a way to um not really build and just like you said just get the money which is um, unfortunate you you, yeah. you, you want to build on that 
you know, it, the collective social theory that's required. Here's, here's my my. This is my belief. This is my belief. My belief around you know us coming together and uniting and getting on this one page on the same page. You know, I don't think it's necessary, right? And, and, you know, I don't think it's necessary. Here's, here's why I don't think it's necessary because historically, every group that has come to power as a group, it wasn't a collective decision to go where they went. It was a few men, few men. It was only a few. It's, you know, who decided what they were going to do. And this is why, this is why I'm big on the development and establishment of life sustaining institutions. Because if you develop and establish institutions that sustain people's lives, those people are going to rock with you because they have a vested interest in rocking with you. You know what I mean? You're sustaining life. You're giving them health care, right? You're giving them health care. You're making sure they eye. Like, for example, why did the Black Panther Party receive so much support in the community? Because they set up the clinics. Right. That's a life sustaining institution, right? They were feeding, feeding the community, right? So it's like, okay, you know, you have moms like, yo, I can't even afford a chicken. Black Panther Party gave me a bag of groceries with chicken and everything in it. You know what I mean? It's like, yo, I got y'all. So that happens, That's and that's a microcosm of what happened at greater scale when you think about the United States, for example. You know, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, you know, uh, that was put together by less than 50 men. Right in a closed room right. and it charted the course of 300 million, right? So everybody didn't get to decide on what was going to be in the constitution. All the citizens of the, you know, all, all the people who lived in, in the United States at the time did not get to decide, you know, all the white people didn't get to decide on what their white companions or the wealthy white guys around them were going, was going to do. They went and they set it up. They didn't even get to decide on the Revolutionary War. It was a handful of white men yeah, who was, decided. Was, right. You know, so they they understood that if they could create the institutions that sustain people's life or take take over those institutions and do a better job at sustaining people's lives, they could they could develop this thing that is now the United States of America, and. Um, and it happens over and over again. You think about the, the United States economy, the industrial era and all of that. It was like four men. It was four men who shifted the balance of power in the United States from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. It was like John David Rockefeller, right? Andrew Carnegie, John Pierpont Morgan, you know, and I, uh, I want to say Ford. I want to say Ford, you know, but... But those guys, they, they didn't say, okay, let's take a vote on it. We need to wake all the white people up and get them on the same, on the same page. Nah, they knew that if they established the institutions, took control of the institutions, financed the institutions, that they would have the power that they needed. You could still have your own belief. You can still be Catholic. You, this white person can still be Catholic. This white person can still be um, Methodist or whatever it is that they are. You know, um, you can be a Satanist. To them, you know, and, and but if you're going to be engaged in these institutions, we have we we're going to be in alignment because these institutions are going to be sustaining your life. So you'll fight for your country after that. <laughs> you know? right. That's the way right. people fight for their country. You know, um, so I don't think that I think that uh, a lot of times, you know, in the conscious in the conscious circles, you know, the conscious school of thought, you know, amongst us, you know, I think that we kind of project onto the the people who don't have knowledge, the the unconscious. You know, we kind of project onto them and say, oh, we need to wake up. You know, you need to wake up. You need to learn this or you need to learn that. You need to get some knowledge yourself. You know, it's, it's not necessary, you know, in order to establish power for right. the group. It's not necessary for everyone to wake up and be on the same page. We don't all have to be Five percenters. We don't all have to be Moors. Right. We don't all have to be Muslim, Islam. We don't all have to be any of that. You know, we don't all have to be Christians. You know, we. You know, we can. We can be. We're not a mon. We don't have to be a monolith right. in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're not. So we. But we can definitely establish. You know, when you go to when you go to the grocery store, you're not asking if the product you came to buy is 
is from is from a, a, a Muslim, you know, or a, or a Christian. Well, sometimes I ask that. Sometimes I ask that. You know, so it's like you know, you're going you, right. You go into Publix. You go into Publix. You go into Kroger. You know, you go into Publix. You go into Kroger. You go into uh, Walmart. shop right. Yeah. You know, Walmart. You go into Walmart. You you buying what you need to buy, and you, you dip it. You know, um, and I think that that's that's the important piece. You know, if the institution is sustaining people's lives, you know, that's what's going to, that's what's going to create the continuity that's required. You know, you look at the United States, United States is what keeps, what keeps the United States together? It's economy, pretty much. Well, at the, um, it's economy, really, I mean, we're technically in a depression, but I, I get your point. Right. I mean, I mean like, depressions are a part of it. You know what I mean? Depressions, repressions, they're part of economies, right? So, the economy is what's keeping it together. You know, we we be like, okay, we got to come together and you know see how these white people are moving. No, 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 no. Let this economy collapse. Let this economy collapse, and all these you think these people are united? It ain't gonna be no United States of America. <laughs> it's gonna be the okay. savage. It's gonna be the most right. savage thing you've ever witnessed in in your lifetime. If it happens in your lifetime, in this economy, it it collapses. It, it's not, it's gonna be everyone against everyone. You know, and that's because the only thing that's really holding this thing together is people's belief that they their lives can be sustained still by this economy. You know, that's it. When they don't feel like this, is, like this thing can sustain their lives, it's a wrap. You know, so, so yeah. So that's pretty much you know that you know Kwame and Kuma had said something similar. You know, uh, in his writings. You know. Um, that you know, you don't need. You know, you can you can unify around, you know, different things. It don't have to always be a religion. It don't always have to be uh, uh, an ideology, a mythology, or or even an economy. You know, it's 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 a, it's quite a few things that you can you can unify around, and economies work well. So um, to your point, right? Um, and that's peace, Lord. That's peace. To your point, though, uh, I get that we don't all use, we don't all need to agree on a particular subject or a particular way of thought. Um, but if if that's the case, then um, do I think that we should have been more um, more better as a race? When I say that, meaning we should have um, been had more businesses, had more institutions, had more um, blocks like the Black Wall Street, right? Um, small businesses mm -hmm. and big businesses. Um, whereas we don't need to all think the same and be the same because we're not. But so to that point, why don't you think that we are progress, um, progressing and we're kind of like devolving? We kind of what? Devolving. I will argue that we're devolving instead of evolving. Yeah, again, it's institutional control. You know, we don't control the institutions. So we need to build up our own institutions then. Yes, right. It's like... And, and so like, why that you... would take some sort of unity, though. No, 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 not necessarily. So life-sustaining institutions are just that. They sustain life. So if the people are devolving, that means that the institutions are not in place to keep them progressing or or evolving, right? So you have to control the institution. You have to control the institutions. Like, for example, housing. We talk about the wealth gap a lot. We talk about, you know, housing ownership, home ownership and the gap in home ownership. We talk about that a lot in the communities, you know, um, but when you look at the FHA Act, the Federal Housing Act, Housing Act in 1934, that basically gave white people homes. It gave them homes with zero money down, you know, fixed mortgages, 30, you know, 30 year fixed mortgages, you know what I mean? But they didn't have to pay any money down. Brand new homes in the suburbs, right? Gave them to them. In the in the policy held that one of the, one of the, one of the uh, clauses in the in the policy was that 
black people could not get the get the homes. Right. It was white exclusive. It was white only, right? So they they sustained the lives of white people through these through this institution through this housing institution. So they created the wealth gap by and the home ownership gap in that one fell swoop just because they controlled the life sustaining institutions they were able to choose whose lives they were going to sustain yep, discrimination right? right so didn't nobody vote on it didn't nobody vote on it it was something that they did they just passed they passed the policy and said yo this is what we're going to do because they control the institution you know so the the, the devolution the the, the the evolving that we're dealing with you know is a, is a consequence of not controlling institutions that sustain life you know, is so you think about, it, you know, school, school is a life sustaining institution. Right. But the schools that we attend, we don't control. We might have black admin, you know, black superintendent, but the curriculum is wholly European. Right. The way of thinking is wholly European, right. you know. So so at the end of the day, it's not specifically designed. It's not designed to specifically sustain our lives. Right. It's not centered. This is why we say African centered schools or African centered reasoning. Right. Because it has to be centered. You have to be at the center of the education in order for it to sustain your life. It, everything around it, everything, the math and everything has to be based on how best to sustain your life. Right. So it's like, cause what is the point of education? The point of education is to, is to solve your problems. Right. That's the point of education. So if the education you're receiving is not solving your problems, then what kind of education are you receiving? You know, and that's, you know, so you have black people with several degrees and still can't figure out how to solve black people problems. Right. In because, because that's what those, those institutions are not designed to do that. So what happens is when we graduated with the degrees, we end up, you know, our, our skill set, our, our base of knowledge end up benefiting other groups more than it benefit us. You know, because we're not the group that the institution was intended to sustain. And this is why we get in this devolved, this devolution, this devolving or dev devolution, you know, that we're dealing with. You know, we have to control the institutions and it doesn't right. take all of us to control an institution. For example, Dr. Hannibal Afrique. Dr. Hannibal Afrique out of Chicago created the Council of Independent Black Institutions. The Council of Independent Black Institutions developed about 40 to schools across the United States. They were all independent schools. My sons went to these schools, both my sons. My, my, my first son, my eldest son went to African People's Action School. My, my uh, 17, now 17 year old son, he went to the Garvey School, right? So these were African centered schools, you right. know, it, under the CB uh, paradigm, Council of Independent Black Institutions. And these schools had a 99% graduation rate, 99%. You had, you had uh, the top preparatory schools coming to these schools to recruit black kids to go right. to their prestigious schools, right? So, you know, my son and my eldest son and three of his uh, – his contemporaries went to the George School, which is like the equivalent to Princeton University for high school. Wow. Right? But it's African centered. No, the George School is white. It's it's oh. it's it's a it's a it's a friend school, which is Quakers, right? Which is it was started by Quakers, but it's one of the most prestigious schools. They have kids from all over the world come to this school, right? So I'll give you an example of some of the attendees in there. Okay, so uh, the guy who wrote uh, Silence of the Lamb, his kids went there. Wow. Uh, uh, Jennifer Paltrow, Gwyneth Paltrow's mother, Blythe Dana, she went there. Uh, the, gig, the guys who own Avino Avino Cosmetics, Hello, they sir. went there. Mm -hmm. Ralph Albanathi's daughter went there. Uh, uh, the brother uh, Solo Nice, Eldridge Cleaver. Uh, yes, Eldridge Cleaver's daughter Juju. She went there. You know, uh, so it that's that's the school. So, but they recruit. They were recruiting from 
African centered schools because the kids were on such a level that they wouldn't find in predominantly black public schools. Oh. Right? So the kids in these schools were getting a better education. Right? They were getting a better education because the education was centered. They were at the center of the of the lesson plan. You know? Uh, it's like it's like my brother uh Baye Kimmick would say he's the founder of the Garvey School all the time. You know, you come in and be like, yo, what's the curriculum? You know, his thing, he, he would always say, the curriculum is that is that sister's head wrap. The curriculum is this is this mama's uh lapa, you know, that 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 shake array, that that bitum bow, those that's the curriculum, you know, and because it was that centered in in African culture, in black culture, African culture and heritage. So it had a it had a more profound effect in terms of education on the youth. Right. You know? Right. And, and all kids went off to do uh extraordinary things, you know, and, and that's that's my point. Yeah. This was one guy who pulled together the, the right people. He created this institution that was sustaining the lives of black youth. So it was being supported by the parent by black parents who got it. You know what I mean? You right. know, so so and, you, you know, I, and that can be replicated. You know, right. and that can be replicated. You know, uh, and as long as you have those institutions, man, you hit, you create the institutions. You know, that it could be a grocery store. It can be a grocery store in your community that you know is going to hire people in the community, going to provide fresh produce for your community. You know, uh, things of that nature. You know, um, and and get the community to rally around it, you know, then you right. can set up, you can, you can give the community equity in it, you know, set up co-ops, you know, make it a cooperative grocery store, right. give them equity in it and, and then replicate it and create chains of that one thing, you know, and move it around. So you become the Kroger's of the black community, you know, uh, the Walmart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but it doesn't, it doesn't take all of us to wake up and get on the same page. It takes a few committed people right that's it it's about right. our commitment right it's about our commitment well, yeah well I, I hope we get those few committed individuals soon man soon but uh <laughs> but uh definitely uh, <laughs> and it's necessary ownership is a must um and um i i hope that your um, business partner um master p um actually is considering opening up a supermarket because he has a lot of breakfast and, and food products um, that can be placed in his own uh, grocery supermarket store. Um, so speaking of um, Master P businesses and institutions, um, how did you get involved in Rap Snacks? And I believe it came out in 1994, if my knowledge served me correctly. How did you get involved with Rap Snacks? Yeah, Rap Snacks was founded in 1994 by uh... My, my guy, man, one of my best friends, uh, James Lindsay, my brother. Okay. James started Raps Next in 1994. I met James in 96. <clears throat> met James like 96 uh, when he, you know, f launched it. Two years after he launched it. And uh, originally it didn't have any rappers on it. It had a caricature of a potato, MC potato on the bag. You know, and he was uh, about to start running ads. You know, he was, he was just starting to he was just starting to do the marketing, get the marketing going on it, and he was going to do ads. So, I did a couple ads for for radio radio spots for the product. You know, and um, you know, we and we just been rocking, man. You know, we've been rocking ever since. You know, so. It started the it started the bubble. You know, it started with eight hundred cases of chips, one flavor, you know, one flavor, you know, and James is such a brilliant mind in terms of business marketing and the psychology behind marketing, you know, that, you know, he saw something that a lot of people didn't see and being rooted in hip hop culture. He understood that hip hop and rap music was a cultural resource right. that we could that we could leverage and monetize for the benefit of, of the, we can monetize and leverage for the benefit of the community. So, so uh, he launched the product. It, it took off, you know, um, opened up an office in Philadelphia. 
We were working out of Maniac back then. We were working out of Maniac in Philadelphia. And um, and that's when the opportunity presented itself when record companies were starting to get sued and flagged for posters and stickers being all over the, the public walls. You know, companies building, you know, companies and building owners were like, yo, sue the record company for putting their artist posters up, mm. right? And um, record companies were in a dilemma around the street promotion. So James, being who he is and how he think, said, yo, this is an opportunity. Let's, let's get them to see if they'll put their artists on our bag. Right. And it like a sticker. So Universal took the bait and uh and they used the bag and and that's when artists started getting on the bags. And then Master P of course was with Universal. Mm. So that's how we ended up we ended up with uh Lil Romeo, Master P. You know, Master P is is one of the most solid people in in the uh in the industry, mm. you know terms of doing business differently than how you know this this is why I, I, I rock with James Master P because they do business different than how people is expected. They're never they're never in the oh that's just business space. You know, you know how people how people are, are rob you yeah. and then and then it's like oh that's just business. You need to you know, do better business. You have to learn how to do the business, learn how to do the business. They don't function in that space. Mm. You know, they feel like they can create new business models that are just and fair. You know, you know, they, they're not trying to rob people. You know, they're not trying to rob people. You know, so Master P, long story short, Master P is like, yo, you put Rome on the bags and boom, indefinitely. Just do, do your thing. Run it. Mm. You know what and I mean? That's when, I guess you can say rap snacks, like, just elevated. Uh, it reps next. It did well. It did well. You know, it did well. It started to get entrenched. You know, um, and then about two thousand two, I want to say two thousand. No, about two thousand four, two thousand five. I think it was. Yeah, about two thousand five, two thousand six. Uh, James started managing Meek Mill. Ah. So James started managing Meek Mill. Okay. And so Raps next was at it was at a, a a plateau. He was like, you know, it reached a level and it was there at that level for a minute. It was James on the road, James all over the place, right? I moved to Atlanta, you know, I moved to Atlanta and uh James was on the road with uh Meek and when they pulled up on Atlanta, he came by the house. He's like, yo, relaunch rap snacks. You got about to relaunch, about to, you know, revamp it, relaunch it, you know? And, uh, I bet. So he launched it and he's like, yo, this time when we launch this time, we're going to have to set up a, uh, a not-for-profit a foundation. Where we can, you know, give back to youth mentors mentor youth in entrepreneurship, financial empowerment, teach them how to uh, capture the resources in the community, capture the resources and try to build institutions around those, those resources, monetize them for the benefit of the community. So right. that we, so we established the, the Raps Next Foundation, you know. Um, and yeah, man, I mean, so that used to me and James go way back. Me and James is like, yeah, we, we like 20 something years in, 27 wow. years in, something like that, you know? So, known James for, for a long time, man. So, long time. So, what's the progression of Rap Snacks, right? So, you stated, you know, y'all relaunched Rap Snacks, you built a foundation for the benefit of the children and so forth. Um, and hopefully, I mean, I know there's still room for growth. So um, what other ideas, what, um, what other businesses along the lines of Rap Snacks uh, do you guys foresee in the future? You know, Rap Snacks is just scratching the surface, really. Right. You know, in, in terms of food entrepreneurship, you know, and, and, it's, and even the snack space. You know, you think, you think about snacks. Snacks is like a $340 billion global industry. 
wow. that covers a lot of different uh, varieties of snacks, you know, and that's not even including beverages, mm-hmm. you know. So, so when you go, like, you know, one of the things that I do with young people when when I'm in these uh, entrepreneurship training with these young with young people, man, you go in the corner store. You know, I take we can walk up in this corner store, and I want y'all to count the amount of products that's in this corner store, right? How many products in the corner store? You know, it's like 250 different products in a corner store, right? Everything from chips, cookies, cakes, candy, chewing gum, water, juice, you know, dairy products, whatever it is. You know, then you have the the uh, the hygiene products. You know, you have all of that in there. You know, toilet paper, paper towels, you have... Toothpaste, you have mouthwash. All of this is in the corner store. Condoms, you know, all of this stuff is in the corner store. You know, uh, and I, and and then how many of them are black owned? Exactly. You know, that's the next question, right? So, how many of them are black owned? You know, and and by process of elimination, it's usually just wrap snacks. Mm -hmm. You know, that's black owned. You know, and um, and then. The next lineup, the next conversation is you can replace any one of them. Exactly. You can replace any one of these. Which one of these products do you want to replace today? You know, create your product, see how we can replace this. So that's that's the thing. Rap Snacks has the potential to replace every snack product in the corner store. Everyone. You know, and is that the goal? Is that the goal? That? I, I, I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say if that's the goal or not. But I, w- I would like to see uh, the community replacing those products and not just wrap snacks. Right. You know, uh, you know. So that's what we that's what we do with the entrepreneurship programs, like our innovation cafe program. We we do food entrepreneurship, teaching people how to develop a product from concept to retail. You know, so so that you know you can you you can produce the products that we're consuming exactly you know and the retail you know it's like so so rap snacks has over 50 distributors nationwide you know there were 50 distributors but so we're distributing a lot of product we're moving a lot of product you know and when you when we go around to these different places like for example in mississippi you know we visit mississippi we go to the distributor there black owned distributor and you know they have they have all these retail stores that they service you know, all the corner stores, they service all, all the, the gas stations, everything they service, all these stores. And our guy is like, yo, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm a, I'm a statistics guy when it comes to black people and you know, what we're doing on the ground, how it looks. You know, I, I like to visit the locations, visit the community, right. you know, and out of a, out of a thousand retail stores that are being serviced, only three of them are black owned mm. in the state. In, in that they, you know, so only three. So not only do we have, not only is there an opportunity there, you know, we say, oh, that's a problem, that's bad, yeah, 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 for sure. But it's an opportunity as well, you know. Not only can we replace the products, some of these products that's being sold, traditional products that's being sold in there, we we can replace some of this retail too, you know. We can control some of that too, you know. Um. And that's very important, man. So, yeah, it's a lot to it. And, you know, not just, you know, so we're backing our way into it, you know, into the product. You know, you're talking about distribution, you're talking about manufacturing. You know, we're not manufacturing in a, any of it. We're not producing any of it. And now we're not controlling the retail. We used to control the retail before integration. Before integration, we control all, the, all of the retail in our neighborhoods, you know. So... Mm. So, um, talk about the uh, affiliate program. Does Rap Snacks have any affiliate programs? Mm-mm. In what regard? Um, in what regard? I mean, like, just in general, like if um, someone wanted to, you know, help um, push the product, how would that situation? Yeah. yeah, when you say push the product, you know, there's a lot of ways to push product. You know, there's marketing, then there's actual. Yeah, well, sell it. Stores. Uh, you What's know, that? Help sell the product. Help sell the product into stores or 
Well, um, first, I guess, in, in, in the communities and then in stores. Well, distribution, yeah. Yeah, well, so, so distribution, yes, absolutely. We actually have a distribution program that we ran out of. Uh, we, we were running that program out of Mississippi, out of Jackson, Mississippi, in fact. And, um, yeah, it's a dope program. You know, but, yes, so what happens is, you know, if, depending on where you're located, we can lock you in with the distributor that we that we already have in place, and get and get a person started as a as what they like to consider a jobber. So what that's one of our programs. The Mississippi program was based on that idea. So what we would do is we would train, we would, the distributor would train the uh, young people, train the young people on how to sell, to retail, how to build accounts. You know. Um, and so once they learn how to run the routes and, and, and sell, then they could develop their own routes and sell. So what happens is young people, a lot of times, or individuals, they would, young adults or whoever, they would start developing their own routes, finding stores in areas that I distributed is not going to, right, and build up their their store. So if you if you if you're one person, you got you got your own truck, got your own box truck van or whatever you got, and you distribute your products, you got about three hundred stores. You're doing good. You got three hundred stores, two hundred stores, a hundred stores. Then then it becomes a matter of okay, am I going to keep servicing these routes or am I going to sell all these routes that I just developed on my own back to the distributor? Mm. I can sell these routes back to the distributor. So it's a lot of ways to look at it. Okay. You know, um, and so uh, if, if a person wants to get into that, um, who would they contact you or send an email somewhere? Yeah. You send an email to info at the wraps next foundation dot org. Um, or you can send an email to me. I'll shoot you. You got my email, right? No, I don't have your email. No. I'll shoot you my email and you, you know, it depends on where you're located again. It depends on where you like located, you know, even, you know, and we can get, get it started. Like for example, our Baton Rouge distributor trained under our Mississippi distributor and our Baton Rouge, Louisiana distributor is a, is a, is a sister, you know, uh, she's, she started out just as a jobber mm-hmm. going to Mississippi three hours from where she lived grabbing product and going and selling it into stores a couple cases at a time, right? Now she has her own warehouse in Baton Rouge wow. with her own management team, her own warehouse crew, you know, her own trucks, her own jobbers. She's no longer under our Mississippi distributor. She's on her own. She's ordering two 18-wheelers. Wow. She brought it up. No, uh, yeah, and you know, she had her own warehouse. I featured her on our uh, foundation's website. She was featured, you know, um, with her sons. You know, she she's a single mother too, a single mother. You know, and she's solid, yo. She's solid. Man, she gets it, done, you know. So that now that's all she do, you know. Right. That's all she do. Wow, wow, definitely. Yeah. definitely so if you're listening to this, definitely get in touch. Um, drop the email one more time, info at rapsnextfoundation.com. Info at the rapsnextfoundation.org. The rapsnextfoundation.org. Type it in here. Yeah, I'm typing it in as well. All right, family. So if you want to get involved, email info at the rapsnextfoundation.org. All right, let's tap in and, and, and let's help push this movement. Let's help push this institution so that we can get more of the ref snacks in stores. And then who knows, you can have your own warehouse and your own two 18 wheelers, just like the sister is doing right yeah, now. If you're, in, if, you're in, like, if you're in New Jersey, if you're in New Jersey. Yeah, I'm in Jersey. Definitely hit, the, hit me. If you're in Jersey, hit me. Right, right. For sure. Indeed, indeed. Man, that was uh, definitely um, a good build right there, talking on business and rap snacks. Family, again, if you're now tuning in, 
If you're now tuning in, welcome, welcome. We are here with Wise Intelligent. We are here with Wise Intelligent from the 90s hip hop group Poor Righteous Teachers. All right, so definitely um, see if you want to see the interview from the beginning, click the link in the bio and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, DTR360 Books. Subscribe, subscribe, and uh, you'll be able to uh, see the whole interview from beginning to end. All right, family. So um, my next question, um, I have a couple more. I don't want to take up too much of your time, beloved. Um, so uh, I asked you before, uh, I'm, I'm not sure um, if you, but you probably didn't really uh, answer it, but what, um, how, how did you come up with the name or your brothers come up with the name Poor Righteous Teachers? Because you're definitely not poor right now. So <laughs> how did you come up with the name Poor Righteous Teachers? 16th degree, 16th degree, 140, which is Muslim lesson number two to the nation of Islam. You know, it, it asks specific, specifically who are the 5%, and the answer is they are the poor righteous teachers who do not believe in the teachers of the 10% and are all wise and know who the true living God is. You know, so 16th degree, 140, that's where the name came from. Mm. Mm. Uh, so let's get into your book. Uh, you're also an author. Uh, you you have the book Three Fifths of a Dumb Down Rapper. Um, Three Fifths an MC, yes sir. Yes, yes, yes. Excuse me. Yes, Three Fifths of an MC, uh, Dumb Down Rapper. Um, so what is that book about, and why that title? So Three Fifths an MC, the manufacturing of a dumb down rapper is oh, about sorry. institutional control. It's about institutional control. It's about how, because we don't control the institutions that propagate rap music, that disseminate the rap music, we don't control those outlets. The, you know, the people who do are in a position to manufacture rappers mm. by what they choose and refuse to pay for. So you have a lot of poor kids coming out of the inner city you know, coming out of these neighborhoods, you know, that they've already deprived of, of sustenance. So, and now they're like, okay, we're not going to sign it if you're saying this thing, but we're going to sign it if you're saying that thing. We're not going to spin it on radio if you're saying this thing, but we're going to spin it if you're saying that thing. You know, so it's, it's sort of like operant conditioning without, you know, where they're not really forcing you to do it, you know? So it's like Pontius Pilate. They can make it seem like they're not crucifying you but they but they actually are you right. know so they they put they keep them trying to keep themselves in a position where they can make it seem like they wipe their hands are clean when they're not you know uh so by controlling the institutions for for, for example you know um you look at mainstream radio right now the top 10 songs on radio on the hip-hop on hip-hop radio are all pushing the same message it's the same messaging it's all sex, it's money, murder. Okay. It's all sex, money, money. It's all, it's all get the money, get the bag. I'll, 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 I'll sex your girl, you know. Which is indoctrination. And I'll kill you, right? So that's across the board. That's across the board. So we don't control that. We don't control the playlist. We don't control the playlist. And people are like, okay, well, the reason they're doing that is because, you know, conscious rap, social political rap don't sell. That's a myth. That's not true. You know, historically, historically, we gonna, you know, the highest selling record in the history of rap music, I think, was at the time was the Fuji's. The Fuji sold 17 million records with the score. Wow. Right? That was a fairly conscious record. Then you had Lauryn Hill with Miseducation of Lauryn Hill sold 19 million records. Mm. Every record Public Enemy ever put out went sold 1 million units. They went platinum. Every record they put out went platinum. So Tribe Called Quest, platinum records. You know, our era, all the yeah, groups that came out of our era, we were 500,000 records out the gate. And it wasn't an era where, and it wasn't an era where you can market easily. You know, it wasn't a lot of, you know, it wasn't a lot of easy marketing. It was no internet. You know, uh, so we had to get out there and, 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 and pound the concrete, you know, and, and do the shows. We had to get in the little conversion van 
and go all the way down the eastern seaboard just performing you know for people to see us we had to work we had to put the work in for real for real just for people to see us you know uh there was no internet you know so you couldn't promote that way but the records were selling the music was selling then they had the the, oh, the argument then the other side the argument was oh you know you can't you can't cross over you know, we need the music that, you know, that kind of music, that political music is not going to cross over. Public Enemy crossed over. Fuji's crossed over. You know what I mean? And and Poor Righteous Teachers, when we were on the road, we were doing all Ivy League universities. Like, it's you know, it's a crowd full of white kids. Even up to this day, even to this day, you go to dead press concerts, there's mad white kids at a dead press concert. You know, so uh, it's a myth. It's a myth. White kids were always 80% of, record, of the record buying public. They always made up 80% of the record buying public when rap, rap went to radio, you know, so they were always the majority buying public, you know, regardless to what the, the content was, regardless of what the subject matter was, you know, but the agenda was to remove that element from the culture, from the mainstream, from the mainstream uh, culture of rap. So now we have this narrative. You know, we have this narrative. So they manufacture rappers because if they're not going to sign me for bringing a political record to them, they're not going to give me the money to to, to uh, release this political record. You know, this record that addressed the socioeconomic plight of black people in the United States. Then if I'm trying to feed my family, I'm not going to try to be political. I'm just going to go and do what they're paying for. Like, for example, when we were kids, we were listening to rap. We listened to rap music. We were in the streets. We were in the street. We, we were on the, we were corner kids. We were corner kids. But coming off, blaring off the, the speakers in, in mainstream was Rock Him. It was Rock Him. It was Public Enemy. It was these were the rappers that was getting mainstream play. Yeah, that's right. So it's like, for example, I wouldn't have knew who Farrakhan was if it wasn't for Public Enemy. Wow. He said, Farrakhan's a prophet that I think you ought to listen to. What he can say to you, what you want to do, right? Wow. That, that's where we learned who Farrakhan was. That's where we learned who uh, Joanne Chestamar was from listening to rap records, right? So KRS-One, you must learn. So like he breaks down the whole his black history in yeah, a record, awesome. right? Yeah. Right, so... So we were learning, but at the same time, they were swagged out. Karis, one of them had to beat the Dapper Dan BDP jackets, right? Daddy King. They was rolling with the BDP jackets done by Dapper Dan. Rock him and Eric B had the, the Dapper Dan MCM suits on the album cover, right? So we were still fly. We were still corner kids, but we were conscious. You know what I mean? I, we were being uh, politically oriented by the music. You know, uh, and that's and that's big. That's very profound, and people don't I think that people kind of marginalize that. But that's very important. You know, the records were selling, the tours were selling out, mm. but they it said no, we're not going to finish. Right. So, so what happened was the shift occurred. You know, uh, with with the uprisings, with the activity on the ground, because the music was orienting us politically to address racism at the institutional level. Right. So we would address these things, like for example, you know, Rodney King and, and the aftermath. You know, um, we were going hard. It was like, you know, we had movements in the street. You know, X Clan had a whole move. Black Watch. Black Watch was a whole movement that was worldwide. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just in Brooklyn, New York. It was worldwide. That's that was threatening. That was very threatening. You know, uh, we were we were all involved in the community on the ground. It was real activists. You know, we helped shut down apartheid South Africa. We helped shut that down. We boycotted everything that they, that was moving any product in South Africa during apartheid. Boycotted it in their records. Sets the Sonic. You know, groups like that. You know, it's like so they knew what they. they that's when they start to realize the power of hip hop and what it could actually do. Right. So they said, OK, we have to we have to switch this out. So they did the same thing they did in this in this late in the early 70s, late 70s, late early, mid late 70s with the exploitation films. Mm. Right. So yeah. they started flooding the airwaves with black exploitation uh, films when black people started to come to a, a level of consciousness and political consciousness and political orientation in the 60s and 70s. Mm. 
So then you saw a whole line of exploitation movies, Nigga Charlie and the, the Return of Nigga Charlie. These were movies that they were putting out, right? So the Superfly, the Mac, they start putting all those movies out, flooding, yeah. the, the, flooding the community, you know, to dumb you down. So the same thing happened again because we didn't learn from the history. We didn't learn from the history. History teaches us what we fail to learn from history. So, you know, it was uh, the, the uh, Moynihan Report in uh, 1967. After the riots of 1967, they did a report on what was causing the young black kids in the inner cities to rebel against the system. And they said they have a high political orientation. The kids who dropped out of school had a higher political orientation than the kids who graduated. And they said that they had been oriented in a way by they've been radicalized by certain music and the atmosphere. So they said, how can we, uh, you know, how can we change this? You know, because they have, at this point, they have a, what they called it, the word they used was an enhanced racial pride. They said they have an enhanced racial pride. Which is you know? good. <laughs> so, exactly, because that is, is going to make you respond to threats against your, your people a, a, a lot differently than you would if you didn't have that racial pride, right? So, for example, it's like it's easy for you to, in order to destroy something, you have to degrade it first. It's degrade and destroy. That's the process. In order to destroy something, you have to degrade it first. You know, it's hard to kill somebody if you call them your brother. Right. It's hard to spin the block on your brother. It's hard to drive by on, your, on, on a king. It's hard, to, it's hard to kill a god. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like yo, we about to go over here and shoot these gods. Nah, you can't. We, we about to go over here and shoot these brothers. You no, 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 no. So you have to degrade you. So you have to become niggas. You have to come become niggas. We have to start seeing each other as, as niggas. They have to degrade. We have to degrade each other before we can destroy each other. They understand that, you know. You know, so um, so it's one of those things, you know. So they started pushing that that narrative, you know, that narrative to dumb you down, make you idolize the wrong things, the wrong lifestyles and attitudes, you know. And 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 here we are. So the manufacturing of a dumbed down rapper is that, you know, you, you, you take a poor kid from Chicago who's come get, going to school every morning to no, to no teachers. 5,000 students in Chicago wake up every morning to no school teachers. 5,000. Like, like, these, like are the kids today? That, these are the, today. So these are the kids that want to go to school, right? These are the kids that want to go to school. These are the kids that are trying to get it right, right? So, I didn't know that. so then you say, okay, okay, I'm going to eat this. I'm going to eat this. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do my thing. You know, then you go through that. And then you end up getting harassed by the police. You know, you get pulled over by the police or you get stopped by the police, getting accosted, getting stopped and frisked for no reason. Police escalating it to where they're punching on you. You know, you're like, okay, I'm going to eat this. And you roll out. You know, and you go home. And and you, you you barely surviving, you barely making it, you know, you know nobody want to give you a, a job around your neighborhood, you know you can't find jobs, you know you're trying to you know do your thing as a young kid. These are the kids who are trying to do it right. I ain't talking about the kids that's that's moving no packages. I ain't talking about no kids that's flipping no birds or cooking up, you know. These are the kids who are trying to get it right, trying to go to school. So then that kid, that kid that's trying to get it right, just start writing about it. Start writing about what what he's going through. You know, and the social political implications of it start to orient himself to what's happening in this community. Like, yo, this is this is the gentrifying my community. You know, my school system is is not up to par. You know, he's writing about it, and then he turned these writings into rhymes. You know, and he started making songs with his friends, and he's like, okay, boom, let's put this record. Let's do a record. They do the record. They take the record. They take the record to the record company. And the record company say, nah, we we ain't signing none of that black shit. Yeah, you know we're not signing none of that black shit. We're not signing none of that political shit that y'all making. You know, so then you're like, okay, so now what do I do? You know, what do I do now? Okay, so then you see all the guys that's getting on is spinning somebody block. You know, spinning somebody block got the double cup with the pro Right. So you know I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it's like you know. So then you start to think that's what I need to do to get on. 
just like us as young kids, we were, like I said, we were corner kids. You know, we were corner kids. 90% of my friends were crack sellers, mm. right? 90% of the kids with me were crack sellers. So we're like, but we're listening to Chuck D. We're listening to KRS-One, you know? So we had, a, it was a higher probability that we'd come out of that stupor, right? You know, so we did and we did, you know, but we were, when we wanted to be rappers, we felt like it was possible because Chuck D was on radio, Karis One was on radio, Rakim was on radio. We watching their videos. Rakim got the crown on with the flag, and like boom, it's like okay, I can do that. But now they just shifted. Now it's like, and and what the youth are seeing now is like okay, I got to look like that now. I got to be like that. This is what I have to be to get on. Right. You know, hands tight. So everything. I got to you know, okay. do what. I gotta do. I gotta do what other people are doing to get on. This is what the label is gonna sign. This is what they're looking for. You know. So, it's the examples, man. It's the examples. You know, the examples that they're showing us. The the narratives, the attitudes, and lifestyles they're showing us. And when you think about it, the the attitude and lifestyle that they're pushing in rap right now in mainstream represents less than five percent of the youth in any in their city. Mm. Less than five percent. So the ninety six percent. 96% of the youth should be the, uh, should be the damn, <laughs> they, they should be the foundation, right? They should be what we should be paying attention to. I mean, that's, that's what we, that's more like what we are, right? They should right? be at the forefront. By right? So, but, but they're not represented. They're not represented, so it's just one lifestyle. So, so yeah, the manufacturing of a dumb down rapper is just that. It's how they control the resources around the music, the monetization, the lanes for monetization. So they try to make you capitulate to a particular standard of, of rap, you know, a particular narrative of rap. And, and, it, and it's been successful. So this is, how, this is how demonic it is. I don't even know if demonic is. Yeah, yeah, we can use demonic because they're on demon time now. That's one of the terms they use, right? With the kids, you know, because they agree on demon time. So the, the record companies won't sign you if you're conscious. They won't sign, they won't finance you. Let me put it that way. They won't give you the finances. They won't help finance your, they won't help finance your marketing and promotion and 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 everything for your project, right? If it's socio-politically correct. You know I mean, so if you're addressing things that's real, you know, if, if you're addressing the interests and concerns of your people collectively, uh, they're not gonna, they're not gonna, push it, right? They're not going to sign it. They're not going to finance it. So you're like, okay, what do I do? But then at the same time that the major corporations are not financing the conscious artists, the government is financing that same conscious artist to go overseas and push that narrative overseas because they know that narrative have the ability to bring down governments that are unjust. So it, it has the ability to, to mobilize you to rebel against oppression, right? So they package, repackage it and send it overseas. This is no, this is not a joke. This is actual fact. This is what they're doing with the music. Right. So that same conscious rapper that can't get one spin on radio in America, can't get one spin, can't get a budget, can't get touring support, can't get anything here in America, can get financed to go to Syria, to Libya, to Egypt, to Yemen, to all of these places overseas, to perform, and just when they send, when they when Hillary Clinton sent that tour out, right after that tour left those countries, that's when we start getting all the youth uprisings in all of those countries. Mm. And what year was this? This was uh, this was two thousand from two thousand eight to about two thousand twelve, maybe two thousand fifteen, maybe two thousand twelve. I have her in the book. I have the whole transcript. Of Hillary Clinton talking about this in the book. It was called the Rhythm Roads Program, and it was under the Department of the Treasury. Wow! Right. So she was Secretary of State. So she was controlled. I mean, it was the department. Yeah, the Department of the Treasury. So she was the Secretary of State, and she was overseeing that program. The That's Rhythm Roads Program. Was in office. What's that? That's when Obama was in office. That's Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So they had a budget of upwards of two million dollars to pay. Black artists, rappers from the hood in the neighborhoods here who were conscious, conscious artists to go and perform 
in these what they call political hotspots. Political hotspots. They would send artists over there to perform because they knew that political hip hop had the ability to mobilize youth youth to rise up against oppression. You know? Mm. So and and it and it worked. And it worked. And she she called hip hop a chess piece. She called hip hop a chess piece on her chessboard. You know? That's what she called it. Yeah. So and they've been doing this and they've been doing this for, for a long time. And you see how I don't know if people know that they did the same thing with through USA. USA got caught financing rappers to try to help overthrow the Cuban government. Mm. I outlined that in the book as well. Okay. You know, so they've been they've been using politically conscious hip hop to undermine governments overseas while at the same time denying politically conscious hip hop the the lanes here to address the oppression that's happening to the creators of hip hop here. Right. right? So so that that's very, very, very not divided, man. That that's a it's a serious thing, man. And I don't yeah. think that people understand the gravity of that. I don't think people understand the gravity of that. The same artist who who can't get play in the country that prides itself on freedom of speech right. can't get play and support. In the country that prides itself on democracy, freedom of speech, and things of those nature, things of that nature, getting packaged up and used as a weapon to help undermine governments overseas. You know, that's that's heavy. You know, uh, but yeah, get the book Three Fifths and MC, the manufacturing of a dumbed down rapper. But that's what they do. And where that's can what we they get do. the book at, beloved? You can get the book on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes and Noble if you want hardcover. But if you want, if you want signed copies, you you get those at my website, watchintelligent dot com. Also, and um, do you wholesale? Because we definitely need a couple of those in our bookstore. Yeah, we can make it happen. I right, bet, bet. All right, so um, what's one or two things that you took away from the music industry? Wow, that's a good question. Well, that music, black music is a cultural resource and a powerful economic resource. You know, black music pumps into the to the American economy rap alone about ten billion dollars annually. You know, uh, and all the and, and it's it and and quite factually, it's one of the United States' highest grossing exports. Music and all American music is black music. America doesn't have any music that isn't black music. Right. It's all black. I mean, hip hop is the number one music in the world. If I'm right. Not Absolutely, and black music in general is 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 one of the highest grossing industries. It's 140 billion dollar industry. That too. you know, right? So that's why when when I'm you know I'm I'm working with not for profits and I'm I'm in the I'm in the communities and I'm working with these institutions and corporations as well. And they like they use these terms. They got this this whole glossary in the uh, in the philanthrop philanthropic space and so you they consider our communities under resourced communities. Uh, you know and I, I and I challenge that. I, I push back on that a lot because our communities are not under resourced. Our communities are over extracted. You know, they're over extracted. <laughs> meaning that we have the resources. It's just other groups are extracting and monetizing them. Right? Music is a cultural resource. We control less than two percent of the re of the receipts in the business of music. That's when we create music, right? It's our resource. It's a it's a cultural resource that is that's produced by our communities. So we have to find ways to capture that resource and create lanes to monetize it without going through their lanes, right? So that the proceeds from the monetization can come back and empower our community and empower those life sustaining institutions that we need to encourage our progression or evolution, as you would say, you know? So, yeah, I, so yes, that music is a cultural resource, a very powerful and viable cultural resource, you know, a uh, very important one. You know, uh, that's one of the things that I take away from music. And uh, 
Secondly, you know, man, there's so many lessons in, in music in, in from the music industry, mm. you know, that, you know, uh, wow. That, you know, your hobby, when your hobby becomes a hustle, it's going to become a headache. Wow. You know, your hobby become a hustle, it's going to become a headache. You know, cash ruins everything around me. Mm. Cash ruins everything around me. More money, so money, problems, money get involved. When money get involved with anything pure, you know, it get it get a little crazy. You know what I mean? It make people detach. You know what I mean? Have you walking around like three thousand? Like man, fuck all this. I'm just play my flute. I'm gonna play my flute and just and, and do my thing. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Man. So, what message would you give to the youth of today? My message to the youth of the day, man, is man, I'm working with youth all the time, man. I'm talking to youth all the time. Okay. And I mean, and, uh, I do have a lot of um, followers that are, you know, 17, 18 in college. So, you know. What message would you give to them? You don't need a major corporation to establish your brand, your talent, you know, and live the life that you want to live. You know, you don't need the major labels to do that. You don't need major corporations to do that, you know. And you know anything that you anything that you you want to do, any idea, you know, take your time, learn everything you can learn about that idea, and everything you can learn about the field, the sector, the industry, whatever it is you're trying to get into, and do it on your own. Do it on your own. You know, don't chase these guys. Don't chase none of these guys. Don't chase them for for jobs. Don't chase them for to be signed. Don't don't do it. You know, especially if you're an artist, stay independent, mm. stay independent, grind it out, do your thing, develop your own audience, you know, you know, build your audience, build it organically, right. you know, think, think in terms of community, not commodity, you know, uh, and, and you can win, you can win because, you know, I just feel like, you know, uh, music you know, uh, as well as skill sets, man, whether it's coding, you know, graphic arts, web design, whatever it is, man, I think that you'll be able to, you'll be able to create an economy around yourself if you think in terms of community as opposed to commodity, mm. you know, you know, I just feel like, you know, when you, when you function in a community mindset, your relationships become more transformational than transactional, you know, and and that's what you want. You want to develop transformational relationships with with your audience, as opposed to transactional relationships. You know, build community, and now the technology exists to do it. You know, indeed, indeed, man. We are winding down, man. Family, thank you for sticking it out with us, man. We are damn near nearly two hours in. Man, uh, thank you, beloved, so much, man. That's a gem right there, man. We need to be transformational, man, instead of partner, uh, partner self, partner self. So we need exactly. to be trans, uh, transformational, transformational, transactional. Right, right, instead of uh, transactional. Man, that's uh, absolutely definitely a gem. That's why you got to look at all your relationships. You got to look at all your relationships like that, you know, you you trans you, you know what can the relationship is based on how can I help this person? How can I help the other person reach their goal, meet their goals, not me. 
You know, if I'm in a relationship with somebody, it's not, a, it's not even about me. It's about how can I help this person get where they're trying to go? What resources do I have? What can I do to help this person be at 100% functioning optimally at 100%? You know, that's, that's what a transformational relationship looks like. And then that other person is going to naturally be in the same mindset. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's an exchange of energies. You know what I mean? It's an exchange of energies. It's, it's not like a, it's not a monetary thing. You know, like I said, it's not transactional, it's transformational, man. You know, we're looking to build each other. We're looking to build, you know, so we're going to build each other. Indeed, you know? indeed. Like, you know, it's like it's like sharing bread, but not eating from the same loaf, you know, filling each other's cup, you know, but not drinking from the same cup. Wow. You know, it's one of them things. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, definitely, we need to transform transform each other lives um, as well as building ourselves up. One last question, beloved, because my battery is on thin right now. Um, so today is uh, Christopher Columbus Day, or some people would say um, Indigenous People Day, where they actually changed the name from Christopher Columbus to Indigenous People's Day. Um, how significant was that name change to our people? You know, I'm not going to throw salt on it because, you know, a lot of people I know, you know, are grateful that is, is, they changed the name. You know, a lot of people worked hard to get the name changed, you know, and I'm not going to throw salt on those people's efforts, you know, and, and, and trying to make change, you know. But, um, again, the person who has the power to change the names of days is the ones who have the power. That in, they have the institutional control, so they can change the name of the holiday. You know, uh, and that in and of itself says a lot about how much power we don't have. Right. You know. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm just my, I, my, I don't function in the headspace where I've, I'm trying to change these institutions. You know, I'm not functioning in that headspace. I'm not in the headspace where I'm like, okay. We need more black cops. We need more black chiefs. We need more black. I'm not. That's not me. I'm not. I'm not the guy that's looking for, for for holidays named after us. That's not me. You know. Uh, again, I'm I'm with developing institutions, controlling those institutions. You know, building people. You know, building people. Man, I I'm not I'm not hung up on the symbols. The symbols and, and things, you know, all the symbolism and the tokens that they shoot at you, you know, uh, like, I, you know, that's not me. That's not me, man. I'm not the guy that's going to be at the front of your protest, you know, I'm not that guy. You know, I'm not that guy, man. I'm, I'm, I'm functioning some in a different kind of way. I'm moving a different kind of way. That's necessary. I think that's necessary, you know, I guess, you know, but um, my move, my, I move a little different. Indeed, indeed. Um, all right, family. So definitely click the link in the bio. Subscribe to DTR360 Books YouTube channel to see the whole interview. We are definitely at least two hours in. Um, shout out to the brother, Wise Intelligent. Uh, man, just um, a beautiful brother doing a lot of things in the community with the foundation. Uh, with a lot of uh, philanthropy work. So I just want to give you your flowers before my phone cuts off. <laughs> um, man, thank you for all that you are doing. Thank you for all that you've done as far as with the rap snacks on the business side, as far as in the nonprofit sector as well. And just like you said, man, just building our people up, being trans um, transformational. Um, and so thank you, man. I want to give you your flowers while you are still here. Um, and yeah, man, one last question, man. My light done went out and everything, but we still go, we still going. Um, name one ancestor, one or two ancestor that has changed your life. I know one is Dr. Amos Wilson. Dr. Amos Wilson. Okay, Amos Wilson. Okay, that's what's up. Dr. Amos why, Wilson. Why Amos Wilson? Say what? I said, why Amos Wilson? Dr. Amos Wilson, basically, I, I consider Dr. Amos Wilson my adoptive father. 
Wow. Right. Because of what I've learned from Dr. Amos Wilson, his writings, you know, his, his lectures, uh, Dr. Amos Wilson gave me the, he, he gave me a level of clarity that I didn't have. Uh, he put, he, he connected some dots for me that I, I badly needed connected in, in terms of clarity, you know, and in the importance of, of social theories, collective social theories, institutional control, you know, uh, being centered, you know, uh, psychology. Yes. Dr. Bobby Wright as well. But Dr. Amos Wilson, yes. Dr. Amos Wilson is like the guy for me, you know, um, without question. Indeed, man. Speaking of Dr. Wilson, man, we have um, all of his books, actually. So um, if you're interested in learning more about Dr. Amos Wilson, um, definitely click the link in the bio and uh, check out and check out our uh, website, DTR360books.com. Man, um, man, again, so thank you, beloved, for your insight. Thank you for your knowledge, wisdom and understanding. Um, this was definitely a great build. Uh, and again, thank you for your patience. And I know we supposed to have been do the live um, since like since August. But um, you know, thank you for your patience. That's why I stay. That's why I stay. Cause I've been putting you off for a second. I've been like, you know what I mean? So I'm like, ah, uh, we we gotta sit down. <laughs> yes, sir. We gotta sit down. I owe you this one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. Um, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Um, family, man. If you are now tuning in, definitely uh, check the link in the bio. And check out our YouTube page. This video, this interview will be uploaded momentarily. Man, um, any last words, beloved? Yes, 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 absolutely. Check for the new project. The new project is coming soon. It's a double album. It's two albums. November 21st. One album is called Poem Chomsky. The other is Mandrill Music. Mandrill Music. And they're both NFT projects. The point of doing it as NFTs is to move, to start moving community away from these platforms and into a space that we have more control over, you know, and in the NFT space, we can control it with, with a currency that doesn't have anything to do with their currency, you know, uh, and we can, and we can share value, you know what I mean? So I'm going to be giving the holders of that, those, that music NFTs, the music NFTs, anybody who get those music NFTs will actually own royalty shares in it. And um, as well as be able to resell it on the secondary market, you know, and it's going to be limited amount of, it's only going to be like a thousand, you know, I'm doing a, a, a membership uh, category with, with only a thousand, you know, for a community that I'm going to push forward, you know, and do other things with outside of music. So, uh, I just want to build a solid. Like Say what? I said that thousand is going to go like that, man. <laughs> just a thousand? We don't you know see. it's going to go quick. We see. We can see. The thing is, you know, whoever's holding the whoever's holding one of those thousand uh, NFTs, you know, they become a part of the, our, our our community. You know, so and this community is going to be doing things offline as well. You know. Um, and just finding ways to strategize and build, you know, and build each other and share value with each other on every level, you know. Um, so that's 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 where I'm going with that. So November 21st, Palm Chomsky and Mandrill Music, you know, uh, it's gonna have a lot of unlockables. Like you'll be able to get vinyl, like classic PRT vinyl that nobody got, you know, uh, or that's rare, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, indeed, man. Before you leave, man, um, kick a conscious freestyle for us, man. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> conscious freestyle. I, we don't got to get into this shit about a best rapper ever. I'm a spitter from an era where you couldn't compare a peach to a pear, apple to a orange, a rose to a thorn, a ignorant motherfucker to a god being born, a virtuous daughter to a hooker selling porn, a gangster off the corner to a Hollywood fraud, caught up in the mainstream trying to be hard. 
Rap's black magic, that proverbial fawn in the side of oppression when the lights turned on. It's all necessary from Pac to Sean John, from me to black god to the lost Bobby doll. The one with all the issues on stage in the thong, carrying on like it ain't nothing wrong. It's all black music, records, songs. But this is for the record, I will give it to them all. Any pussy with a penis, any jenny with the balls when the roof ripped off. From the god you gotta call, you can fall till you fall, you can buy out the ball, keep tricking with the bitches trying to burn down them all. You can summon historical oracles, either try seeking no reason to figure me out. I'm in a Anomaly, dead in the doubt, phenomenally running my mouth. This is my house. I call it a shrine. It's how I define this magic of mine. It's more than a rhyme. Ahead of its time, a lyrical map, a spiritual guide. This black music is the black magic. As talents, we need the high priest. Watch me resurrect the dead insurrection. This revolutionary see. <laughs> this is from my people where the gods come from, not a cosmic slum. I got a double edged tongue. Wait, what a piece of body throw will you get it from? Come to me, walk like a champion, pon your boy. <laughs> Let me get out of here, man. Get out of here, man. Book. Yo, at least you know, I do you, fam. This is what we do. Yes, yes, yes. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom, shalom. Hotep, Islam, Alafia. Peace. Peace.